Faith family, welcome to online worship. We are so glad that you are joining us from wherever you are at. And I just want to say for those of you watching online, you are just as much a part of our church family as those worshiping with us in person. So welcome. Uh, if it's your first time uh, checking us out, uh, we are so glad that you are here and uh, we are excited to get to know you. And so we would love to have you go to our website, fclc.org, and click on the connect button tab and fill out some information about you so that we can get to know you and send you information about all the great things that God has going on here at Faith Community. As we begin our worship service, let's begin by confessing our faith together through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Welcome online community, it's good to see you, <laughs> why don't you worship with us, we're singing open the eyes of my heart, it's an oldie but a goodie, <laughs> up a sing. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, I want to see. I want to see you. Yeah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. I lift it up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy. Oh, Holy, 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 I want 
to see you. Uh, we're going to start this morning with Psalm 65, 8. And it's up on the screen. And what I'd like us to do is read it together. Uh, and yeah, let's read it together. Psalm 65, 8. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. Where morning dawns, where evening fades, you call forth songs of joy. So that first verse, the whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. And so this morning, we're going to talk about awe and being in awe of God, what he has created, who he is, and what he has done. I think uh, we live in a great place where we can look all around us and see the wonders of God. And this last weekend, Steve and Joshua had a long weekend. And so we went backpacking and we went to the Dominguez Canyon wilderness area, uh, which is south of Grand Junction a little bit. So it's a little bit more on the deserty side, but it was stunning. And of course, pictures don't do it justice, but I've got some pictures for you this morning. Uh, look at these roses on the cacti. They just were gorgeous. And you might be able to see the dew uh, that was there in the morning too. Just stunning, stunning. Uh, and then it's a little bit more of a desert and there's slot canyons and those kind of things. So we actually... We had the pups with us, of course, too. They had to, they had to adventure with us. So we actually climbed down that um, and then up to this ridge. And just uh, the colors don't show in the picture as much. But look at that. Like, it is just absolutely stunning. And we would stop and just, uh, just look because trying to take it all in. Oh, there's my girl. That's Sven, one of our pups. Uh, she was very happy, too. Um, and then Josh is always fun to hang out with. And so we camped by the stream, too. And because uh, it's been such a wet spring, it was actually overflowing in its banks as well. So we got to play, uh, play in there a little bit. Um, and here I am with the, with the pups. Things did not go as planned, <laughs> which they never do. So the pups and I hiked out a different way than the boys did. Um, and we actually spent a lot of time in the river. <laughs> unintentionally. And then check out this guy. Have you ever seen something like that? It was so cool. Um, I guess it's called a collared lizard. Um, and it's called a common collared lizard. I'm like, what? How are those common? Look at those colors. Isn't that stunning? And so all around us, we could see the wonders of God and what he had created. And we would just stop because we were in complete awe of what was around us. Well, this next weekend, um, Saturday, we are heading back to Lake Okoboji in Iowa for a family camp this summer. And so I have a few pictures, too, of Lake Okoboji. Uh, this is the crew that went with me last year. <laughs> They're super fun. A few of those guys are coming back, too. But look at the water behind it and how blue it is. Um, it's, a, it's just a gorgeous place, and it's a huge lake. There actually, it's rumored, that's Jess and her best friend, and just look at that lake and the clouds and uh, the sun rises uh, over the lake there, and it's just beautiful. There we go, there's a sunrise in the morning, and it's just absolutely stunning. For those of you who know Iowa, you know, but for those of you that are like, Iowa, what is what? <laughs> it is said that there are only three blue water lakes in the world, and one of them is Lake Okoboji. And so it's got this super clear blue water. It's glacial, actually. It was formed from a glacier. Now, at the deepest point, it's about 139 feet. So it's a deep and big lake. And there's subterranean springs underneath it that help it keep this cool, clear blue water of the lake. And so we're heading there on Saturday. I am blessed to be the family speaker this year. And so I'll be teaching Bible studies every day. And uh, one of the really fun things I get to do too is lead devotions with the staff. And it's mostly college kids. And so it's always fun to have those uh, first moments with them in the morning too, um, to be able to spend their time with them. And then extra special this year, 
Um, Laura C. Sutavangza and her family have been a part of our faith family for quite a while. And um, they have a new little one, Ezra, and they have a lot of family in Minnesota. So they're going to come down and meet us at the lake, and I'm going to baptize baby Ezra in the lake right there. So isn't that cool? Yeah, I love how God works. So uh, so we're really looking forward to that. We'd appreciate your prayers um, for, for all that will happen that week and the hearts of everyone that will be there. Uh, but it just, it, there are mornings. We go out, we love to go out to the sunrise and go out on the dock and just sit there in amazement. You can see through the water, and then just as the sun rises up, it's that moment of awe where you can just sense this awe. And so we're going to talk this morning about awe. This is what we're starting our week off with at Okoboji next week. And I thought, what a great way to start our week is by talking about awe and the sense of awe that God gives us. So again, Psalm 65, 8. The whole earth is filled with awe at your wonders. So the word there, awe, in Hebrew, yaira, um, has this idea of fear, also has this idea of respect, reverence, worship, awe, amazing, astonishment, reverence, wonder. Uh, in some cases, with an emphasis, it's this idea of being actually dumbfounded. And so uh, there's this idea of awe at, at who God is. And so uh, when we talk about awe, we're talking about beholding something that is beyond our capabilities and understanding. Beholding something that's beyond our capabilities and understanding. So let's talk a little bit this morning, take some time to think about who God is. Uh, because as we do that, it moves us into a place of awe. So there are a couple verses that I included in Thursday's email. If you've had a chance to read those, otherwise we'll look at them together now too. So Psalm 33, 8 is another one of those where it says, Let all the earth... Fear the Lord, and that can be translated awe. Let all the people of the world revere him. Uh, let them stand in awe of him is another translation of that. And then when we go to Psalm 99.3, let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. And so I mentioned in the email too about names of God. Did you all think of any names of God that you know this week? What are some of the names that we call God? You got to say it loud because I can't hear you. <laughs> Abba. Abba, yes, that daddy, right? That really intimate Abba, father. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh which means our provider. Yes. Yahweh, yep, that's a big, strong one, isn't it? Yep, absolutely. Uh, in the Old Testament, there are lots of the Jehovah names. And so you mentioned Jehovah Jireh. Janelle, there's Jehovah Rapha, which is the Lord, our healer. There's Jehovah Shalom, which the Lord is our peace. There's Jehovah Ra, which is the Lord, our shepherd. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is here. And then there's some other names that we find throughout scripture too, including Adonai, which means Lord. Uh, Jesus also says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the what? The beginning and the end. Uh, Elohim is found in the very first verse in the Bible where it says, uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. It's in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens of the earth. And it means the supreme one, this mighty one. And we find, uh, and we uh, hear this more during Advent season, but there's prophecies too that name Jesus, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. And during Advent, what do we celebrate? God is with us, which, what is the word? Emmanuel, yes, Emmanuel, uh, that he is with us. And then of course there's Lion of Judah, as well. And so there's, and there are so many more names of God. But think about that. God is all of those things. Perfectly all of those things. So that causes a sense of awe at who He is. 
It's absolutely amazing. And so recognizing who he is and thinking, and I mean, we could spend a sermon, we probably could, Bruce could probably do a whole series on some of just a name, a single name of God, because there's so much meaning to it. And so as we consider who God is, it moves us into this place of awe. Also, when we look at what he's done, that also moves us into a place of awe. And so in the New Testament, the word that's used, uh, it's translated awe or filled with awe, it describes people's reaction to astonishing works of God. Astonishing works of God. And so that starts way back in the Old Testament, of course. And, and this weekend in Thursday's email, I had to read Exodus, a verse from Exodus 15. And if you had time to back up to Exodus 14, which is the story of what? The Red Sea, the crossing of the Red Sea. I think it's so easy when we read those stories to just kind of go through them because we've known them so well. But think about standing in the middle of the Red Sea where there's a wall of water. Water's liquid. It doesn't usually stand in a wall, right? A wall of water on each side. Only God can do that. Only God. And it creates this sense of awe. What are some other stories in the Bible uh, that create this sense of awe of how amazing God is and what he can do? Say it again. Oh, the building of the ark. Yes. Yep. That whole process. Absolutely. Yep. What else? What's another story? Miracles, yep, lots of miracles, absolutely. Anything else? Sodom and, Sodom and Gomorrah. Mount Carmel is one of my favorite stories where they douse the altar with water and God sends down this fire that takes care of all of that. Um, so there's all of these stories that create this awe of, of what God is able to do. We move to the New Testament. Jesus rebukes the wind. Do you remember that? Uh, and it describes the disciples as being in fear and amazement. Uh, Saul's companions were speechless, it says, when Jesus appeared to him. Uh, casting out of demons as well. All of these stories that show us that only God is able to do that. And it creates this sense of awe which draws us closer to him and to understand who we are in him as well. So it's not just Old Testament, New Testament, God doing those things in the past, but God is in our midst, in our lives, doing the same things, doing things that only he can do. So Jess is our middle kiddo, um, and she's heading into her junior year of college. And so her senior year of high school, uh, she decided she wanted to go to CSU. So in the fall, she applied, got that all going, accepted, ready to go. And then in April of her senior year, April of her senior year, she decided she didn't want to go to CSU. <laughs> it's like, it's, yeah, it's April. Uh, and so uh, she's like, I really want to go to a smaller college. I'd like to go to a Christian college. And so she found Belmont University in Nashville, Tennessee. And so she and her best friend and Abby and I flew out to take a look. And I don't know if you've ever been out there, but it is gorgeous. It is gorgeous. And they put out the red carpet, let me tell you, when you visit. And so the girls were like, oh my gosh, I just love this. This would be awesome. Um, then we saw the tuition numbers and <laughs> it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, but they were just, they're like, this is it. They fell in love with Nashville. If you've been to Nashville, it's a really fun place too. Um, and so they left thinking that's probably where they would end up. Well, we were getting on the plane to go to Nashville. Jess's best friend answers the phone and she's like, yeah, we could only hear her side, right? She's like, okay, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, thank you, bye. And we're like, who was that? She's like, oh, it was this other little college and I guess they gave me a full scholarship or something. <laughs> we're like, that's kind of a big deal. Kind of a big deal. So, uh, so they loved Belmont, but we were saying, you know, it's good to keep your mind open and it's worth a trip to check out this college. And they're like, it's in Missouri, Kansas City. They're like, uh, no, thank you. But being the wise women that they are, they did take a trip out there. And it's a small Jesuit college, uh, university, um, Rockhurst University in Kansas City. And they fell in love. They met the student minister, um, the father uh, who's president is just absolutely amazing. The Jesuit culture has this emphasis on service. 
And so there are just all these pieces that came together. And so, uh, so she just finished her sophomore year out there, uh, and she wants to go in occupational therapy. So the other piece of this, too, is that the fall that she started, uh, they shifted their program around. And so their occupational therapy program now, she does her first three years of undergrad, um, and she finishes her undergrad in three years. The fourth year is grad school work, but at undergrad tuition. And then she has a year and a half of grad school and she'll have her doctorate in occupational therapy. Wow, wow. right? That's one of these moments where God moves. And do you see all those layers of how God did that and the circumstances and the people and their hearts, the way that he brought that all together? Only he can do that. I couldn't have orchestrated that <laughs> had I wanted to. And so we have these things that happen in our life now that also create the sense of awe where we stop and we go, wow, only God can do that. So let's turn to Luke 5, uh, the story of Jesus and Peter, some of the other disciples as well. Uh, but let's read a little bit of this, the first passage here, uh, Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. We have it up on the screen as well. I always love the stories of Peter. So it says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all his companions were what? Astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, uh, Simon, Simon's partners. So then Jesus says to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. So they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. So this story also has this idea of astonishment, that wow moment where God does what only he can do. And I want you to look at verse 8 again, uh, at Simon Peter's reaction after Jesus does this, and he fills, uh, fills both of these boats to sinking. And what does Simon Peter does? It says, when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus's knees. He fell at Jesus's knees. Awe moves us into this place of humility. It gives us perspective. It allows us to see God moving in these powerful, amazing ways for those wow moments where we just are in awe of what he can do. And there is not an encounter, direct personal encounter in the Bible, I don't think, where the individual was not visibly shaken by God's awesomeness. Think of Moses when God appeared in the burning bush and he hid his face, didn't he, Moses? Uh, Isaiah also uh, trembled when he, when he saw God. Uh, when Jesus appeared to Saul, they were, they were afraid and, and amazed as well. And so whenever we encounter God, those wow moments, those moments that move us into this awe, we react in this way, where we humble ourselves with this humility uh, and we recognize uh, that God is God and we can surrender all to him and it moves us into this deeper relationship with him. I think in our culture, in our lives, it can be very easy to lose that sense of awe. So I just want to talk uh, quickly here about some ways that we can regain our awe. Because I think there is a battle for our attention. And one of Satan's greatest tools is to distract us. We're busy, we're inattentive, we worry, like Chaz was talking about, there's all these things that distract us from being in awe of God. And so one of the things that we can do to help regain this sense of awe is just to slow down. We miss so many things. 
And it can be simple things, just getting outside, going for a walk, taking a picnic lunch, uh, paying attention to your five senses, to look, to listen, to smell, to touch, to taste, all that God has created and allows us to experience in that. One of the things I love with spending time with little kids is seeing life through their eyes uh, because they have a very uh, different perspective and they often see details that we don't see, that we overlook. So we live in a great neighborhood and all three schools, elementary, middle, high school, are all right there and we can walk to all of them. So in elementary school, we would walk to school and uh, it was funny, one day we were leaving and one of our neighbors that has older kids was out and she's like, oh, She's like, did they change the time? Does school start earlier now? And I'm like, no, it's still the same time. She's like, you've got like a half an hour. I'm like, yes, it's like a 10 minute walk. Um, and I'm like, yes, because you would not believe the things we find on our way to school. There are rocks and there are bugs and we can count the legs on the spider. One of our neighbors has that lamb's ear and so we had to stop and touch that every day. <laughs> all of these things that the kids would see along the way. I could have gotten to the school in about five minutes and I would not have seen any of those things. But the kids' pace is a slower pace and they're paying attention to what is around them and they were in awe of even these smaller things that God has created. And so slowing down can help us regain this sense of awe. Sometimes even more than slowing down is to stop. Job's, uh, in Job it says stop and consider God's wonders. We are used to being entertained. We are used to things moving quickly uh, that we don't have to pay attention ever for very long. Uh, and so it can be hard for us to stop. And it might feel, because we're so entertained all the time, it might feel like it's uneventful, and it might feel like it's uncomfortable. And yet in those moments when we stop to consider who God is and what he has done, God moves us into this sense of awe, and he moves in a really deep way. And so uh, to regain awe, we can slow down, and sometimes we need to come to a full stop. Another way that we can regain our eye, our, our awe is by beholding God. And so Yaira, the Hebrew word, has to do with beholding something that is beyond one's capabilities and understanding. So let's look at Psalm 27.4. says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. And so the, uh, the line to gaze on the beauty of the Lord can also be translated to behold the beauty of the Lord. We're all pretty good at beholding, but what do we behold? Sometimes it's our screens, sometimes it's our job, sometimes it's our status, sometimes it's our Facebook feed, whatever that might be. And yet here there's this idea of beholding God that draws us into the sense of awe and into a closer relationship with him. And so we can regain awe by beholding God, to slow down, to stop if we need to, and to behold. And then finally, there's this idea of remembering as well. So Psalm 145, verses 4 through 7, says this. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They, uh, they celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. So one generation commends your works to one another. This idea that we share, we talk about, we remember what God has done. You might remember in the story of Joshua when they're crossing with the ark that he has them pick up a stone for each tribe and to set it on the side so that they could look at that and remember what God has done. 
to remember what God has done. Because as we look back and reflect on that, it creates, again, this sense of awe at how awesome God is and all of the things that he can do. And in our personal lives, too, you all know that we're in a challenging season and it's hard to see. Sometimes we can see God's fingerprints, but we don't exactly understand what's going on. Looking back, though, with 2020 vision, with some other things I've gone through, it's so clear to see God working and moving in the amazing ways uh, that, that he does that. And so we remember in our own personal stories too, and it moves us to this sense of awe. So you all know nature leaves me speechless and in awe. And really the only word I can come up with sometimes is wow which is not adequate <laughs> enough, but there, there isn't a word that can encapsulate all of this. So I want to, once you listen to this quote from Max Lucado, next time a sunrise steals your breath or a meadow of flowers leaves you speechless, remain that way, say nothing, and listen as heaven whispers, do you like it? I did it just for you that the greatest awe that we can have, the greatest work that God has done is in sacrificing his son. And when we come up to communion, what we're doing is remembering what God has done. And it moves us to the sense of awe that God would sacrifice his son, that he would raise him again Easter morning, raise him from the dead, that we can live forgiven and free. And he did all of that because he loves you. So awe has this idea of beholding something that's beyond what we can understand. It's beyond any capabilities, understanding that we have. And to regain our awe, we can ask God to walk with us, to help us to slow down, to help us sometimes to just stop, to help us learn how to behold him and to help us remember who he is and all of the awesome things he has done. So I'm gonna give you an easy way to start regaining awe if you've lost your awe today, and ask as you leave today, whenever you're leaving from uh, the building to head home, look west. Long's Peak is stunning, and that whole mountain range. And I know I say this all the time, but when I turn on to 66, it catches my breath every single time. It is amazing that God created that, and he created it for us. And we're able to enjoy that because of where we live every day. And so look west and allow God to renew and, and regain the sense of awe for him, for who he is and for what he does. Let's pray. God, you are awesome, and there are not words to, to be able to describe who you are uh, and what you have done. And so truly today, we stand in awe of you, amazed at who you are, uh, all, of, all of those things that you do for us, all of those things that you did throughout the Bible, uh, which only you can do. And so we pray that you would continue to open our eyes to you, uh, that we, as we move through our week and we start our week looking at long Long's Peak on our way out of here, that you would just help us to slow down, to stop, to behold you, and to remember who you are and all you have done. We praise you today, and we continue to stand in awe of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we celebrate Holy Communion today, we invite you to use whatever you have available in your home setting, whether that would be bread or crackers or grape juice or wine. We invite you to join us as we remember again the words of institution, that it was in the night in which he was betrayed that our Lord Jesus took bread. He broke it and he gave thanks and he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this to remember me. And again, in the same manner, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this to remember me. So take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you.
Please join me as we pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for worshiping with us today. We are thankful for your presence and the ability to be together online in this community. We'd just like to remind you that there are many ways that we worship and we serve uh, God and we are good stewards of what we have. And so we continue to offer online giving. Um, you may also uh, write a check if you'd like to and mail it into the church or if you're local and wanna come by and drop it off, that would be great too. We have seen God be so faithful in his provision and the way that he has been able to work through this congregation because of your generosity. Uh, over and over again, we just hear amazing stories of how he is able to do that. And so we appreciate you being faithful in your giving financially as well. Remember to check the website. There are all sorts of great things going on here and the website has our most current information. We'd love to get you connected uh, even more with this congregation. And so check the website to see what's going on. Thanks again for being with us.